very controversial and divisive issue of the millennium, this thousand-year period. Let me, first of all, go back to these seven visions. Read as a series of seven, they present seven consecutive events. <coughs> and therefore, the millennium comes after Christ's return. Or to put it another way, he returns and that is followed by the millennium. Those who believe that are called premillennial. And pre means Jesus returns pre-millennium. He returns before the millennium. A second view is called post-millennium because that view believes that Jesus will come again after a thousand years of peace and prosperity on earth, which frankly puts the second coming off for another thousand years. This view, post-millennialism, believes that the millennium comes before his return. And therefore they teach that chapter 20 actually comes before chapter 19, or is in fact a recapitulation, a throwback, a looking back. You see? So that that's the first huge division between premillennials, who believe Christ comes before the millennium, and post-millennials who believe that he comes after that thousand years. Then there is a third view called amillennial, and a means non. They should really call themselves non-millennial, but they don't like to be nons, so they call themselves amillennial as in atheist, or amoral, it means non. So the amillennial says there isn't going to be a thousand-year period at all. And they therefore treat this as not connected with any particular period of time. Just a general picture of uh, something else and not a time period. So let's now sort of look at the varieties of the three views because I'm afraid under each of the three views there are two. So that uh, there are in fact six different positions on this one. Well, I did say the second half each afternoon was going to be complicated, didn't I? I wish people didn't disagree. It would be so much nicer if we just took Scripture as it stood and that was it, but I'm afraid people don't. So let me look at the... Uh, three views again, but this time from the fact that each has two different angles. Strictly speaking, the amillennial or the non-millennial who doesn't believe that there ever will be a period of a thousand years of Christ's rule on earth, either before or after his coming, there are two groups there. The first I call the skeptical non-millennials and they just find the whole idea absurd and they dismiss this passage of scripture altogether and they just say it's either John was suffering from indigestion or a bad headache or something at this point but it, it's meaningless that's the skeptical view that the millennium is meaningless it has no message for us and you find a lot of liberal Bible scholars who take that view they just can't make any sense of it at all but then there is there are those who do take the passage more seriously but treat it as a myth, as an allegory, as a story with a truth in it but not history. Do you, do you follow me? Much as people treat the beginning of the Bible as myth and say you have to demythologize it to get the meaning, that you mustn't treat it as a real period of time. Uh, it is simply an allegory, a picture uh, of what God would uh, feel is ideal, that Christ and the Christians ruling the earth would be ideal. It links up with that view of interpreting the whole book as idealist that I mentioned earlier. Do you remember that? The whole thing becomes an idea rather than an event. It, it's just a sort of an embodied idea in a story. But they do take it a bit more seriously. The skeptical dismiss the whole passage. The mythological amillennials treat it as an allegory. So the one treated as an absurdity, the other as an allegory. Now, at this point I've got to say something that will 
probably confuse you even further. Most Christians in this country call themselves amillennial, but when you scratch them, they're not. I mean, most evangelical Bible-believing Christians call themselves amillennial. The London Bible College has a long tradition of amillennialism dating back to its founder, Ernest Kevin, who taught it very strongly. But in fact, they are not amillennial because if you ask them, don't you believe that chapter 20 refers to a period of time at all? They say, oh, yes, we do. Oh, which period of time does chapter 20 refer to then? And they all say, well, this church age. Now, to me, that makes them post-millennial. Do you follow me? They hide under the label amillennial, but they're not amillennial. There are very few evangelical amillennials. They are actually post-millennial. They apply chapter 20 to the church age before Jesus gets back. So they do believe it's a period of time. Do you follow me? And I only mention because if you went here, out of here and you asked a lot of evangelical Christians, which are you? They would nearly all say amillennial, but if you ask them, they're not. But they don't want to be called this. But that's what they actually are. So let's call a spade a spade. An amillennial doesn't apply Revelation 20 to any period of time. A post-millennial applies it to this period of time. A pre-millen applies it to the period of time after Christ's coming. Are we clear so that we can go a little further? Right. The real amillennials are usually in 2A. They're not in that at all. They are really spiritual post-millennials. Now, what do we mean by that? A spiritual post-millennial believes that Christ and Christians are reigning now, but only in a spiritual way, that we can cast out demons and march around cities and so on, but all we can do is um, reign over evil in a spiritual, not a political way. We are not the government, but we are a spiritual government, that Christ is already reigning in heaven, the dead saints are already reigning in heaven with him. And in a sense, the church has spiritual authority so the church can reign over evil now. You follow me? Now that's what most who call themselves a millennial actually are. They believe we're in the millennium, but that the only reigning that there will be will be spiritual. The other form of post-millennialism is the belief that the church will take over the world and rule it for a thousand years. That in the name of Christ, the church will rule the nations, uh, not that everybody will be converted, but that the majority will be, and so the nations will become, quote, Christianized nations, and therefore the church will take the throne of this world over before Christ comes back. Now, looking at the world today, we're a long way off that, and therefore we're at least a thousand years off the second coming. But it's amazing how many people are believing this, and it's coming over from America under some unusual titles. Reconstructionism. Have you heard that word? Anybody heard that? You have. Well, this is what they believe, that the church is going to Christianize the world and take over and rule the world on behalf of Christ before he gets back. Well, how many of you have heard the word restoration? Right. Well, now that's another word for it. And Restoration Magazine, before it went bust, had an editorial comment under the title, each issue, which said, we believe that the church will bring the kingdom, sorry, will establish the kingdom worldwide before Christ comes. And the restoration movement of 10 years ago believed that we were going to take the world over. Many people left mainline denominations and went over to house churches believing that we were on the verge of taking the world over. And still some young people of today believe this. You know, we're marching for Jesus, we're going to drive Satan through the Channel Tunnel into France, but we're going to clean England up in the name of Jesus. You know the kind of talk. Uh, I'm caricaturing it, but there's a lot of this naive optimism around. 
that we're going to take the world over in the name of Jesus. I think a bit of realism doubts that. Another name that it's coming over from America under is Dominion Theology. Any of you heard that? Well, Restoration, Reconstruction, Dominion all believe that the church will take over the world and that the last part of the church age will be the millennium after which Jesus gets back. So there's the spiritual post-millennialism that says that spiritually we're in the millennium now and there's the political version that says we will soon be taking the world over and running it. Then the premillennial has two versions. One is our old friend dispensationalism, which I talked about last time. And uh, you would know what I'm going to say now from last time's talk, that the dispensational premillennial, you find most of these among the brethren and who've read the Scofield Bible, believe that the millennium is after Christ's coming but is largely concerned with Israel and the Jews on earth and is not at all clear where the Christians will be. Whereas the classical premillennialism of the first five centuries of the church believe that the church will be ru ruling the earth with Christ but that the Jews will by then be part of the church. Now those are the six views. It's very complex, isn't it? And unfortunately, you'll find all these views in books on Revelation. Now, I think you can guess which I am. 3B. 3B. I believe it's the most straightforward reading of Scripture. Now, let's try and find out which each of you are, if anything. And maybe all this is new to you, but let's try and do it with a simple chart. Right. Now then, question number one. Will there be a period of a thousand years during which Christ rules on this earth? You answer yes or no. Now supposing you say no, then you are an amillennial. You don't believe there will be a millennium, right? You're non-millennial. So you then ask a further question. Does this passage in Revelation 20 have any meaning or not? And if you say, no, it has no meaning, you are a skeptical, a millennial. But if you say it has some meaning, not for history, but it, it has a truth in it, which can be applied at any time, then you are a mythological, a millennial. But supposing you said yes to the first question, yes, I believe there will be, a period of a thousand years within the history of this earth, you then ask the question, well, do you believe it will be before or after Christ's return? And if you say after, you are a premillennial. Christ comes before the millennium, premillennial. If you say it is before he comes, then you are a postmillennial. Now, if you've come down to find out you're a premillennial, you then ask a further question. Will this thousand-year kingdom on earth be a Jewish or a Christian kingdom? And if you say Jewish, you are dispensational premillennial. And if you say Christian, you are a classical premillennialist. But if, on the other hand, you said no, this thousand years will be before Christ comes, you then ask, does it refer to the whole of the church age, even though it's now less than 2,000 years, is, is a thousand years a round term for the whole age, and therefore the rule of Christ is not political, but it's spiritual. You are a spiritual post-millennium, but if you believe the millennium will be the last part of the church age, when the church politically takes over the world and establishes Christendom worldwide, then you are a political post-millennialist. Now, I've tried to put that as simply as I possibly can, though it's very complex, but you'll find all these shades of opinion among Christians. Now, could I ask, you're not committing yourself to anything, but how many now 
know what they are. Well, that's encouraging. Some of you do. The rest of you probably have never even thought about it or have not been aware that there is such a division among Christians about all this. But anyway, that's the way to tell. And if you meet somebody who says, I'm an amillennial, just say, are you sure? <laughs> and just check it out with this. I think you'll find most who call themselves amillennial are in fact spiritual postmillennialists. Right. Well, now, those are the different views. Just a word about the history of those views. The early church for the first 500 years was solidly classical premillennial. That's why we call it classical. They looked forward to what they called the bodily reign of Christ on earth. And about 30 or 40 writers in the first 500 years all look forward to a day when Christ will come and reign on this earth with the saints. And the interesting thing is that for the first 500 years there is no trace of any other view. So when did all these others' views start? Well, the first change came with a man called Saint Augustine. I don't know why they call him a saint, because that man has done more damage to the church than anybody else because he reinterpreted the gospel in terms of Plato. He introduced Greek thought to Christian thinking, and we've been Greek ever since in our thinking, and the church needs to be de-greased and to go, to, to go back from Greek thinking to Hebrew thinking. But it was Augustine who turned the church into Greek thinking. It was Augustine who really put the seal on baby baptism, for example. It was Augustine who wanted Christianity to be an established religion with church and state brought together. And in fact, Augustine was a spiritual post-millennialist. And he took Revelation 20 from after Christ's return and he put it before and he said, Christ is reigning now and the saints are reigning with him spiritually. And, of course, in his day, the Roman Empire had become Christian. And they really thought they were taking the world over. So that was the second. This was the first. That was the second. But you can imagine, as during the Middle Ages, the church and the state became one kingdom called Christendom, it moved through to this and became political post-millennialism. And they really thought they were in the millennium with the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor and the Pope running everything. And they gave the Pope the symbol of two keys, a silver and a gold key, as head of the church and head of the state. Political and religious power came together. So by making the millennium a spiritual thing, this is what Augustine did with so much in the Bible. He spiritualized it, allegorized it, and he took away the reality of it the Hebrew reality of so much, he spiritualized it all. He saw the church as the new Jerusalem. See? He brought it all into the present. Read his book, The City of God. So that this was the first, that was the second, which led to this. The next to appear was the dispensational view which appeared in 1830. And most people think all premillennials are dispensational. That's the confusion I'm into all the time. People say to me, what are you? I say, I'm premillennial. They say, oh, you're a dispensationalist. I say, no, I'm not. I'm premillennial as the early church was. I believe the church will be reigning with Christ on earth. And that the Jews will by then have accepted Christ and be part one with us that when they see him whom they pierce, they will be converted. So we've established this historically. This, of course, came with liberal critical scholarship at the end of the 19th century from Germany. And liberal interpretations of Scripture came sweeping in, and you'll find that most liberals today are one or the other of those two. So one, two, three, four, 
five, six is the order in which they appeared. I'm happy to tell you that there is a note, notable swing back today to classical premillennialism. And I give you one or two names. Hal Lindsay, of course, is here. But I give you one name here, George Eldon Ladd. G.E. Ladd, L-A-D-D. Any books by him are tremendous books. And he led the way back to this. Another name is Merrill Tenney, T-E-N-N-E-Y. Do any of these names mean anything to you? Is there a library in the college? Well, look up any books by Ladd or Tenney and you'll find uh, they are calling the church back to classic premillennial. Uh, I just have to say that I came not through either of them, but through just sheer study of the Bible. I came to this view 25 years ago and have stayed with it since. I find it very encouraging that there is such a swing now back to this to reconsider it. And uh, among others, people like Tony Higton in this country are now preaching classical premillennialism. Well, you must make up your own mind. Um, people say, well, why argue about all this? I want to show you in a moment that it has very practical implications. But let me begin by showing you how the different views actually interpret Revelation 20. Because that to me is the key. How they handle Revelation chapter 20. I'm only going to look at the post-millennial and the pre-millennial because those are the only two views really held by evangelical Bible-believing scholars. If you put the millennium before Christ's return, how do you then interpret Revelation 20? And I'm really saying, which is fairer to Scripture? Revelation, the post-millennial interpretation of Revelation, or the pre-millennial? And I've, I'm looking at both, the spiritual and the political. In interpreting Revelation 20, both lots of premillennials are identical, whether they're dispensational or classical. So that I'm going to compare the whole premillennial with those two. The thousand years, the spiritual postmillennialist says that's a symbolic figure. It simply means a long time. And the fact that it's already been 2,000 years doesn't matter. The political is a little more definite. Sometimes the political say it's symbolic, sometimes they say it's literal, but they all say it's the last period of the church age before Christ comes. Premillennials usually take it literally a thousand years. So there's a difference of interpretation there. The rider on the horse. Now here, the postmillennials have a problem since the rider on the horse comes after chapter 19. Sorry, the millennium comes after the rider on the horse. So what do the post-millennials make of that? Well, they say if chapter 20 is in fact a sequel to chapter 19, then the rider on the white horse must be Christ coming at his first coming. And the white horse is spiritual. Get it? wasn't a real horse at all. It was actually a donkey, but it, spiritually it was a white horse. Do you follow me? Now, I mean, it begins to me to get ridiculous at this point. Those who accept that 20 is a sequel to 19, that it's part of the series of seven visions, they apply that rider on the white horse to the first advent of Christ and therefore spiritualize it. But more post-millennials treat chapter 20 as a recapitulation. They say 19 is the second coming, but then the vision goes back 2,000 years to the millennium that began with his first coming. You follow me? So either way, I think they're messing up the scripture. The premillennials all apply to the second advent. Because if chapter 19, the rider on the white horse, is the first coming, then there is no mention of the second coming in the whole 
of the text of Revelation, apart from the prologue and the epilogue. And to cut the second coming out of the book of Revelation is amazing, isn't it? To apply it to the first advent. Now, let's take Binding of Satan. I think I'm going to begin over here and work backwards. The premillennial says that he is bound in the future by an angel and he is totally limited and can do nothing. All those six verbs, you remember? Seized, chained, thrown, imprisoned, sealed, locked, all of it. And the premillennial takes that as meaning that G devil is, Satan is banished altogether from the world for the thousand years. And it's done by an angel. But you find the post millennials can't cope with that because if you try and apply that to the present, who's carrying on the business if Satan's no longer here? You see? Got a problem. So how do they get around it? Well, they say that Jesus bound Satan when he was here the first time. It's not an angel binding Satan now, they just forget that. They say Jesus talked about you have to bind a strong man before you can spoil his goods. Therefore, Jesus bound Satan, but the binding was only partly effective. And he's still quite active. Now, to me, that is just twisting through. How can Satan be seized, chained, thrown into dungeon, sealed and locked, and only be partly limited? That's the way they get round it. The political post-millennialists would say that the binding of Satan is something to be done by the church. And I'm sure you've heard people binding Satan before a meeting. And Have you heard all this kind of thing? Never find that in the New Testament. But it's become quite a, a common form of prayer. I, I'm hearing it everywhere I go. We bind Satan in the name of Jesus for this meeting. I wonder where we started that. It's all part of this post-millennial thing that came in. So, Satan is bound by the church in the present and he can be severely limited by that and will be, but not entirely. So, which of these three is being truer to that? I ask you to ask all the way down, who is being truest to Scripture? It says an angel binds him totally. But here in the present, it's the church binding him severely or Christ binding him only partly in the past. Which is truer to Scripture? Let's take the first and second resurrection. The premillennial takes them both as physical. How can you have a first and second if they're not the same thing? They are both bodily resurrections. In fact, the same verb is used of both. They come to life and the rest of the dead do not come to life until the end. Now, how do the post handle that? Well, they make the first resurrection spiritual, that that happens at your conversion, and the second resurrection physical at the end of history. You see, for the post there is only one resurrection of the body, for everybody at the same day. And therefore, the first resurrection becomes a spiritual one, a resurrection of the soul around the body when you're converted. <coughs> they all get rounded that way, which is truer to Scripture. The loosing of Satan, the premillennial said that's at the end of the millennium, the postmillennial says it's at the end of the church age. They have a very different attitude to the restoration of Israel. The premillennial usually believes that Israel will recover her own land. Postmillennials don't believe that. They can't believe that God has brought the Jews back to the promised land in our day. They only believe in a spiritual restoration of the people of Israel. And in fact, one of the last issues of restoration criticized very severely those who believe that God would bring the Jews back to their own land at the end. And a number of my friends said that will end the magazine restoration. And sure enough, a few months later it was bust. But on Israel, there's a big difference. The post-millennials do not have any understanding of modern Israel in the light of Scripture, whereas premillennials do. The reign of Christ, the premillennial, says it will be on earth 
because the whole of chapter 20 is on earth, whereas the post-millennials either say it's the reign of Christ and dead saints in heaven or spiritually through the church on earth, but it's not an earthly reign. Now, here comes an interesting difference. Of these views, which has the strongest emphasis on the return of Christ? And the answer is the premillennial. You'll find that a premillennial view goes along with preaching the second coming strongly. The political postmillennial preaches it quite weakly. They are the weakest on the second coming because after all it must be at least a thousand years ahead. The postmillennial spiritual medium, sometimes they mention it, sometimes they don't. It has quite a direct effect. And if you ask, when a Christian prays every day as Jesus taught us, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, do we expect that to happen suddenly or gradually? The post-millennial expects it to happen gradually over the centuries. The pre-millennial expects it to happen suddenly when Christ comes. Well now, I only ask, do you think that column or those two are not twisting scripture. That's the real issue to me. And I believe that these are deliberately squeezing scripture into a previous decision they've made that it applies now and not future. But let's face the question, how are we doing for time? Let's face the question very straight. What does it matter now, there are many people today who say it doesn't matter which you are. Um, I'm sure you've heard a new label that people are now using, tongue-in-cheek. They're calling themselves pan-millennial. And if you ask them what is a pan-millennialist, they say it's someone who believes everything will pan out all right in the end, whatever. <laughs> in other words, that label is running away from the whole issue and won't think about it just says, oh, well, wait and see, it'll all pan out. That, to me, is escapism. That's not eschatology, that's escapology. Right, some of you are still awake, even in the afternoon. Right, so let's ask, what difference does it actually make to our behavior in this world, which we believe? A friend of mine was asked, are you amillennial, premillennial, or postmillennial? My friend said, that is a preposterous question which I thought was one of the neatest responses I've heard. But actually, it is a very practical issue. And it has a profound effect in two areas. In evangelism, winning the lost for Christ, and in social action. By that I mean whether you try to make this world a better place than it is. Now you see, it does have this effect and this time I must show that classical and dispensational premillennialism have a quite different effect. Let's look first at evangelism. Now dispensation, no, we'll look at both together. Let's start with dispensationalism, which uh, is one of the most common among evangelicals because of the Scofield Bible and Hal Lindsey and Brethren influence and so on. Dispensationalism which believes you remember that Jesus could come any minute, that produces a terribly high motivation for evangelism. We must save everybody we can now in case he comes tonight, you know. But it has just the opposite effect on social action. And you tend to think of the world as the Titanic going down and all we have to do is to try and get a few more souls into the lifeboat. Do you see what I mean? There's no point in painting the Titanic now. And dispensationalism produces very low motivation. What's the point of trying to make the world better if Jesus could come back tonight? Do you follow me? But what it does do, it makes you very keen to win everybody you can before Jesus gets back. So that's the pattern of dispensationalists. Very high evangelism, very low social action. Classical premillennialism has a high motivation 
not very, but high for evangelism, not so high as the dispensation. It says he might come back tonight. I must get my children saved before tonight. You know the kind of thing? Um, classical is high. On social action, it's medium. It's average. Uh, classical premillennialism gives some point to making this world a better place for a reason I'll come to in a moment, but not as low, not nearly as low as the dispensational view. Now, post-millennialism of the spiritual kind that believes the millennium we're already in and we're reigning spiritually now, that has a medium motivation for evangelism. It's not high and it's not low, but it has a low motivation for social action because it spiritualizes everything. See? So you don't do anything political. You, the church establishes a spiritual kingdom. You with me? Uh, so uh, you do good. It would tend to concentrate more on personal welfare than on political reform. Do good person to person. But post-millennial political view again is medium in its motivation of evangelism but terribly high in social action because if we're going to take the world over before Christ comes you know, we better get on with it now. And so there's a terrific motivation to get into government, to take political to engage in political protest, to to get involved in political life and reform. Um, liberation theology of Latin America would come very clearly into this. It's the hope that the church will liberate the poor and take over the world and even things up. And you know, um, Might even be low on this side in evangelism. But uh, now you can see there, I've, it's an oversimplification but it's my observation that the views you hold about the future do have a profound effect on your attitude to the present. It's not an academic issue. And uh, that's where I would want to be, quite frankly. But that's how I've observed and as I've talked to people. And I find the Reconstructionists, the Dominion Theology, the Restoration were very, very high here on taking social action. Medium to low on evangelism. And we've seen a swing in this country recently from evangelism to social action. Let me spell it out. <coughs> There's been a huge swing of money from missions to relief. Things like Tear Fund and Christian Aid and so on have been going ahead by the million whereas missions to evangelize are crying out for money and are often in real crisis. So we've seen a very strong swing from evangelism to social action in this country. And when you ask what lay behind that, it was the loss of premillennialism, I believe. Now let me now say why I believe that classical premillennialism has a much greater motivation to social action than dispensational. Dispensational sees the millennium in Jewish terms of the kingdom of Israel re-established and ruling the world. Whereas classical premillennialism saw Christians involved in running this world for a thousand years. And that gives you a very practical motivation for getting ready to do so. If Christ is going to need magistrates and bank managers and others to handle the affairs of this world, then you have a motivation to be working towards that. Do you follow me? Of learning how to do it. Whereas if it's only going to be Jews on earth and we're going to be in heaven, what's the point? Do you see what I mean? And so a, a classical belief in the millennium after Christ comes involving Christians, the church, gives us a very sound motivation to be good bank managers and good magistrates and good this, that and the other. To be ready to run the world with Jesus. Do you follow me? 
whereas if he's coming to take us out of this world as dispensationalists emphasize then what's the point why try to make this world better now you see a premillennial does not hope to take over the world before Christ gets back but is getting ready to take it over when he does do you follow me the post-millennial, especially of the political variety, expects to take the world over before Christ gets back. But I think he will be disappointed. And we don't seem any nearer that now than we were 2,000 years ago in terms of proportion and government. I think the Babylon is far more likely and Antichrist is far more likely in the near future than church taking the world over but the amillennial has no hope of ever seeing Christ rule the world in any way the postmillennial hopes, believes that he, he is ruling the world now spiritually but many have hopes that he will also rule the world politically through the church but not in his physical presence whereas I do have hope more I have a certainty that Christ will reign on this earth and that I'll be helping him to do it and that gives me a hope for this world a depolluted this earth even before the new earth well now what does scripture have to say about all this because that is ultimately the test and post millennials and a millennials have you all got this down post millennials and a millennials often tease premillennials and say Revelation 20 is the only passage of scripture that talks about the millennium so is that enough basis for such a big belief if it's the only passage well now even if it was the only passage it's still part of God's word and my reply is how often does God have to say something before we believe it within the passage itself the thousand years is specifically emphasized six times it isn't as if it's just once mentioned keep saying thousand years thousand years thousand years thousand years thousand years thousand years six times furthermore on two occasions it talks about the thousand years with the definite article now that's pretty clear and you can't just dismiss it too easily next I would point out that the church has built other doctrines on one verse so why shouldn't we build this on one passage may I give you two examples only one verse in the whole of the New Testament that appears to apply the name Israel to the church that's in Galatians 6 and then it's ambiguous it's not even clear yet how often have you heard the church described as the new Israel and there's only one possible verse in scripture that does that the word Israel is, a, is used 74 times in the New Testament and only on one occasion could it possibly be applied to the church yet the church has built the doctrine of the church as the new Israel on one ambiguous verse so what's wrong with building it on Revelation 20 another example the church absolutely insists that you are baptized in the name of the Trinity that without the Trinitarian formula it isn't a Christian baptism uh, have you come across this I baptize you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit every baptism in the book of Acts was only in the name of Jesus they were baptized into the name of Jesus there's only one verse in the whole New Testament that talks about baptism in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit in Matthew 28 all the other verses and there are many only talk about being baptized into the name of Jesus yet the whole church has built on one verse a whole doctrine that baptism isn't baptism if it hasn't been the name of the Trinity which I don't believe and in fact there's a kind of movement among some Pentecostals called the Jesus only movement have you heard that 
and they believe you're not baptized properly if you've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It has to be Jesus. So I pleased everybody. I used to say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you into the name of Jesus, into his death, burial, and resurrection. <laughs> and that kept everybody happy. But I don't believe that it's got to be the right formula to make it work. <laughs> that seems to me to be getting into legalism. But I'm just giving you examples of where the whole church is building doctrine on one verse. And yet here is a whole passage which mentions six times the thousand years. Why can't we believe it? Well, there can be two other objections to building a belief in the millennium on one passage. One argument is negative and the other is positive. The negative argument is the absence of confirmation that there are no other scriptures saying it. The absence of confirmation. That's a negative. And the positive argument is the presence of contradiction that other scriptures actually rule out the idea of a millennium. Now, those are the two further arguments. First argument is it's only in one passage, as if therefore you can ignore it. Second, <coughs> second argument there are no other passages that mention it. Third argument, there are other passages that contradict it. Are you with me so far? So this is why there's been all the argument about it. Well, let's look first at the absence of confirmation. Certainly, Revelation 20 is the clearest passage, but it is not by any means the only passage that indicates there will be a reign of Christ on earth. What about the rest of Revelation? There are at least three places where the millennium is mentioned in the rest of Revelation, for a start. Chapter 2, verses 26 to 27 says that overcomers will rule the nations. My question is when? Overcomers will rule the nations. And yet overcomers may be martyred. So when will they rule the nations? must be in the millennium after Christ raises them from the dead. Chapter 5 verse 10 says that Christ has redeemed with his own blood from every kindred and tribe and tongue and people men for God. And they shall reign on the earth. Redeemed people will reign on the earth. They shall. Not they do, they shall. When? The only answer can be the millennium. Or chapter 11, verse 15. The, John hears a song being sung, Hallelujah, the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. When? When? I don't believe that's happened yet, do you? But it's going to happen. It's promised. So in the rest of Revelation, there's plenty of indication about the millennium. It's not confined to Revelation 20. Now what about Paul's letters? Let's take 1 Corinthians, for example. 1 Corinthians 6.3, Paul is saying to the believers at Corinth, I hear that some of you are going to court and suing other Christians in a pagan court. He says, how dare you? Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases of your own? Now when will the saints be the magistrates and judge the world? He's saying, how dare you go to pagan courts when you are going to be running the courts. You ought to learn to settle issues within the church because you're going to settle them for the world. And incidentally, when he says, don't you know that the saints will judge the world, he assumes they've been taught that. That it's part of his teaching when he first founded the church. That you're going to judge the world. That that's the kingdom that's going to come. He's certainly not talking about the day of judgment, which will be in the hands of the Lord alone. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 to 25. 
the chapter on the resurrection. And he says, each will be raised in the right order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who are his, and then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to the Father. There are two thens. Do you notice, therefore, there are three stages of resurrection? Christ, then it is coming, those who belong to him, then the end, the general resurrection. So that there are three resurrections, actually. Christ is the first, and then there are two others. Those at his coming who belong to him, and then the others. Again, it backs up Revelation 20. Now, I've already mentioned this unusual phrase, the out-resurrection out of the dead, which is used in Philippians 3.11. It is also used in 1 Peter 1.3. And it's talking about a resurrection of believers before the dead are raised, out from among the dead. So here we have clear recognition that there isn't one day of resurrection for everybody, but two. Again, it backs up Revelation 20. Are you still with me? Some of you are frowning, and I don't like people looking like that. <laughs> are you with me? Right. Did I just tell you 1 Peter 1, 3? Use the same thing. Let's come to the Gospels mainly Matthew and then Luke. I could give you so many references here. Um, look, I'll have to go fairly quickly through them. They'll be on the tape if you want them, all right? Or just put the references down quickly. Luke 1.32. A prophecy about Jesus before he was born. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob. Has that happened? The throne of David is not in heaven. It's on earth. Has Jesus sat on the throne of David yet? Is he ruling the house of Jacob yet? So when will he do that? There must be some time that prophecy is fulfilled. Matthew 5, 5. The meek will inherit the earth the earth. When? Matthew 19, 28. Jesus said to the disciples, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Has that happened yet? When will it happen? Matthew 20, 21. The mother of James and John said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. Now Jesus told us to pray every day, Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. When will that prayer be answered? The dying thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And if you ask the dying thief what kingdom he was talking about, he was talking about Jesus as the Messiah sitting on the throne of David. He was a Jew. That's what he was asking. The parable of the talents. In Matthew 24, 21 and 23, the reward for faithful servants is, I will put you in charge of many things. Luke's version of that in Luke 19.17 is, take charge of ten cities, or I will put you in charge of five cities. When? Luke 16.11-12. to 12. If you cannot be trusted with money, who will trust you with true riches? If you are not faithful with the property of others, who will give you property of your own? Now, when do we get these riches and these property if we've been faithful? See? 
must come a time when these things are all fulfilled. Luke 20.35 But those, he talks about those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection out from the dead. In other words, there is a resurrection out from the dead of which you can be worthy. Whereas the general resurrection happens automatically. Similarly, Luke 14.14, 14, Jesus says, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Again, the resurrection of the righteous is different from the resurrection of the wicked. What about the book of Acts? Acts 1.6 Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. So let me go carefully into it. If ever you ask someone a question, if ever I'm asked a question, I often don't answer the question, but I unpack the question. Because built into every question are certain assumptions. We call them premises. For example, if you say, David, have you stopped beating your wife? I will not answer the question. Because you built into the question an assumption. So if I said yes, I would be admitting I had been beating my wife. If I said no, I would be admitting I was still beating her. You frame the question in such a way that I can't answer it. Do you follow me in that? Now behind this question, Lord, do you restore the kingdom to Israel at this time, are four assumptions. Number one, Israel once had a kingdom. You can't restore a kingdom unless it was once there. Number two, Israel has lost the kingdom or it would need to be restored. Number three, Israel will recover the kingdom. They were confident it would be recovered. And number four, that Jesus would be the one to do it. So in their question, they have assumed four things, that Israel once had a kingdom, that it doesn't have it now, that it's going to get it back, and that Jesus will give it back to them, right? And the interesting thing is, Jesus does not challenge one of those assumptions. Based on those four assumptions, they only have to ask when, now or later. At this time, when are you going to do this? And Jesus did not say, I'm not going to do it. He didn't rebuke them for asking the wrong question. But every preacher I've heard refer to this verse has said they asked the wrong question. No, they didn't. Jesus didn't rebuke them. What he said was, it is not for you to know the date that Father has fixed. Now what does that answer tell you? It tells you that it's going to happen. When? Okay. Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the date Father's fixed. Now supposing they had asked him, they'd asked him, Jesus, will you now kill Pilate and Herod? And he'd said, it's not for you to know the date Father's fixed. What does that answer tell you? It tells you that he's going to do it, right? Not that it's wrong to ask, but that he's going to do it, you see. The very answer Jesus gave accepted the question as valid. Now, that's a very important point and he's very careful unpacking because most people assume they asked a silly question and all Jesus said was, I want you to be missionaries to the ends of the earth. No, he didn't say that. He said, it's not for you to know the dates, Father's fixed, but I do want you to get on with the job of being witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, the ends of the earth. That phrase, the resurrection out from among the dead, comes in Acts 4.2. So, you see, all the way through the Bible, there are many hints and indications 
that really only fit into a future reign of Christ on earth. You with me so far? That's my answer to the absence of confirmation elsewhere in the New Testament. It's there if you look for it. But secondly, the presence of contradiction. And the main argument here is that there are texts that imply the simultaneous occurrence of events that Revelation 20 separates. In other words, there are events that in Revelation are separated by a thousand years, which in other parts of the New Testament appear to happen together with no thousand years in between. You follow me? Two, two in particular. First of all, the resurrection of the righteous and wicked is mentioned as if it all happens on the same day. Let's take one example. John 5:29. Jesus said, a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Now that sounds as if the resurrection of the righteous and wicked are the same event. Do you follow me? Whereas Revelation 20 puts them a thousand years apart. Or verse 25 of the same chapter, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who are here will live. Well now, I believe that that can be spiritualized, but it is also true that Lazarus and Jairus' daughter heard the voice of the Son of God and came back from the grave. I don't believe that verse is a reference to the end times, but it's often quoted that. But verse 29 is, and it looks as if the two resurrections are together. The next two things that appear to come together elsewhere are Matthew 25, uh, 31 onwards, <clears throat> the sheep and the goats parable. It says, when the Son of Man comes, he will separate the people. Put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. As if it all happens together. At his coming. You see, here, the coming and the last judgment have been put together. When the Son of Man comes, he will judge, separate. <clears throat> and there are other texts, for example, 2 Thessalonians 1, seven. God's vengeance against persecutors will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, which again looks as if the judgment and the second coming happened together. Do you follow me? Now, it's on the basis of those apparent contradictions that um, the post-millennials say that there is no millennium after Christ's coming. The third thing that they point to is the phrase, the day of the Lord, which covers the second coming and the last judgment, and the same phrase is used for both, the day of the Lord. And if you take the word day with anything like a literal sense of 24 hours, it means the coming, second coming and the day of judgment happen on the same day. But I believe the word day of the Lord there is being used far more generally in the sense that man has had his day and God will have his. And the day of the Lord covers quite a period actually. Um, and if you read the phrase the day of the Lord in the Old Testament it covers a lot of events it's the day when God puts things right rather than the 24 hour period as many take it now what do we say about those others <clears throat> the resurrection of the righteous and wicked appearing to be together and the second coming and the day of judgment appearing to be together oh my time has gone so quickly <clears throat> well <clears throat> We are here dealing with prophecy, predictions about the future. And one of the characteristics of prophecy in the Bible is what we call prophetic foreshortening. As if the prophets look through a telescope into the future and see events squeezed together through a telescope. As if you are looking at mountains from a long way away through a telescope and you see two peaks that look together. But if you went to them, 
you'd find there's a big valley in between. And you find this telescoping happening uh, constantly in all predictions about the future. They see things are so close that they can't see the gaps in between them. For example, the Old Testament only sees one coming of the Messiah. But we now know that between his first and his second coming is a huge gap of at least 2,000 years. But looking ahead through the centuries, they saw the two comings together. And they spoke of only one coming, both to save and to judge. We now know that he was coming first to save as the suffering servant and second time to reign as the king of kings. But they saw him coming as savior and king together. And that is why, of course, they didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, because he didn't come to rule. But he will do it, his second coming. Now this foreshortening of future events is characteristic of prophetic vision. And they see future events together. And so they could see both resurrections as the resurrection of everybody. The first and second coming as the coming of the Lord. And in fact, this happens with many other prophetic uh, visions that later in the Bible they get separated in time. Do you follow me? Things that are seen together actually take place at different times. And I'm sure that's what has been happening in both these cases. I mean, when you're looking forward through 2,000 years, it looks as if the second coming and the day of judgment are right together. But later it is explained they are not together. It looks as if the dead all rise at the same time, righteous and wicked. But when you get closer to the events, as you do in Revelation, you see that in fact they are separated by some time. This explains Jesus' parable of the rich men who died, and it says he was in Hades suffering the fires of hell. Now that's a contradiction, isn't it? Because Hades is where people go after they die, not hell. And the fire follows the day of judgment, which is still future. But Jesus telescoped the two to get across his point in a parable. He was not trying to teach a complete program of the future events. He wanted people to realize that the state of that rich man beyond death was much worse than here. And so he squeezed Hades and hell together and had the man suffering torment in the flames in Hades, which is an anachronism. Do you follow me? But you see, to make his point, he squeezed the whole future into one picture. And that's what prophets were constantly doing, squeezing the future into one picture. But in fact, it's like seeing the distant mountains through a telescope, all crowded together. But then you walk towards them, and when you reach them, you find there's a great valley in between them and they're quite a, a long way apart. Now, I believe that's what happens as you go through prophecy in the Bible. Go through the prophecies of the Old Testament, they're squeezed together, but they gradually get spread out in the new between the first and second comings of Christ and between the first resurrection and the second, and the whole thing becomes clearer and the valleys in between the peaks become clear. Well, my time has nearly gone, so let me finish with the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of prophecies about the future of a day on earth when the saints will reign on the earth. A day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Now, in particular, Daniel 7 repeatedly makes these predictions. Let me just run through them. It says, he saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom. The Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. And it's all on the earth. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven, under the whole heaven, will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. My answer is when? 
I believe Revelation 20 picks up all that from the Old Testament as well as the hints in the New and gives us a crystal clear picture that after Christ comes again, the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the saints of the Most High and they will reign over the nations. That means us. And of course, if you really believe this, you realize that the job you will get on this earth in the millennium relates directly to how you do your work today. How faithful you are now. How reliable you can be looking after other people's property now. So what a motivation this is. He's coming back to earth. And of course, many Christians I talked to haven't even realized that if Jesus is coming back here, so are we. It's here we get our new bodies. And when he comes back, even all the dead Christians come back with him. Why back here? So that we can show this world what it can be like. I finish with one promise in the New Testament. New Testament promises that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. They will not confess that Jesus is Savior, but they will confess he is Lord. When? I believe that's the millennium. Well, you must study the different views. You must come to your own conclusion and conviction. I can respect people who hold a different view provided they have searched the scriptures and they're not just passing on what they've been told. I can respect someone who's got a different conviction from mine provided they have done as much hard work as I have in studying the scripture and really come to the conclusion and that they're not mishandling or twisting the text to fit their ideas. Well, that's enough for today. <coughs> My voice is going. So uh, we'll see you again and we'll look at Revelation 21 and 22, the happy ending. You must come and hear that. Otherwise, Revelation would leave you depressed. I want to leave you rejoicing. Good.